Um, so yes, I come from the University of Leeds and um, I am co-leading a project called Citrus Safe, which focuses on the valorization of byproducts uh, from the Chinese, uh, Chinese citrus processing industry. And today I'm going to tell you, tell you a little bit about this project and some of the innovations in packaging that were realized, uh, but also will focus most of my talk on a survey that we did on the consumer attitudes and behaviors towards recyclable and compostable packaging in the UK and in China. <clears throat> so the CitruSafe project was an academic industrial partnership uh, project uh, involving uh, academics from both the UK and China and industries from the UK and China. Um, so from the academics perspective, there was the University of Leeds, Zhejiang University and Zhejiang Gongzhang University. And we were funded by the BBSRC, the Newton Fund and the Ministry of Science and Technology of the People's Republic of China. The academic side, uh, sorry, the industrial companies, including Parkside, Flexibles, Caracol, Biopowder and two uh, industries in uh, China uh, called Joyful and Huayu. And the um, industry partners were funded uh, partially by Innovate UK, which is the innovation agency for the United Kingdom. So the global issues that we were trying to address through CitruSafe was to reduce food loss and waste, as we know that a third of food is, uh, that, that is produced is lost or wasted before it's eaten. And packaging has a really good role in preventing uh, some of this food to be lost. And just reminding you that wasted food represents, represents a waste of resources in terms of the land it's needed to, to grow it, the energy, the water, the labor that goes into it. Um, but also that it's, you know, disposal of food waste also poses a burden to land and aquatic environments. Through Citrus Safe, we were also uh, addressing uh, food safety, again, a place where packaging has a big role to play. And we do know that, um, you know, around one in 10 people in the world will fall ill after eating contaminated food uh, with a loss of many millions, uh, loss of healthy life years. And finally, we were looking at dietary health. Uh, we know that obesity and overweight are rising worldwide. And uh, a lot of this obesity can be attributed to poor diets. And these poor diets are characterized by low fiber intakes, uh, where in general, across UK and China, we see 30% lower intake of fiber than recommended and high intakes of saturated fat. Uh, so I will take you a little bit through what we did uh, in that aspect as well. So the project was organized in terms of valorizing this waste from the citrus uh, industry and looking at food safety in terms of formulation using byproducts from the citrus uh, processing industry as natural additives and preservatives, uh, but also a big component was packaging, either using the materials directly to make packaging or as active materials or coatings on already existing packaging. And we have already heard some talk, some of that aspect, uh, how it's done in, in the previous talks. Um, and then through the health aspect, we had a, a branch that looked at utilization of these byproducts in skincare, which I'm not going to talk about today, and also application for functional foods and supplements. Uh, so it was quite a, a large program of work, um, but um, I will tell you a bit more about the packaging later. Um, why the citrus processing industry? Uh, well, actually, China is now the biggest producers, producer of citrus fruits in the world. The annual production last year of around 39 million tons of citrus fruits, and about half of those are mandarins, um, citrus uh, unshu. The processing industry generates about 1 million tons of solid waste streams, primarily as peels, but also pips and other solid residues, and 2 million tons of liquid waste streams. How are these waste streams uh, produced? Um, yeah, we'll talk about this uh, later. Um, so we start obviously with the, the mandarin fruit, uh, which is then peeled uh, manually actually to uh, have the segments. And we have then uh, the peel waste. 
which we can use as a resource. The segments are then separated, again manually, and these are soaked in an acid bath uh, where we get uh, some of the membrane around the mandarin removed and the production of this acid extraction liquid, which is this liquid you can see here uh, flowing through these pipes. Uh, the segments are then uh, soaked in an alkaline bath, uh, which will remove the remaining of the membrane and you will generate an alkaline extraction liquid. These segments are then canned or they can be put into bottles like this one, okay, and then uh, exported and enjoyed throughout the world with a very good and long shelf life. The extraction liquids can be uh, combined and that neutralizes the liquid um, and the liquid waste is then uh, treated with ethanol to precipitate some biopolymers and then you end up with uh, some ingredients which are uh, reusable in several uh, applications. I should say that this liquid waste uh, has um, high chemical oxygen demand. Um, so currently China has some uh, legislation that says that this liquid waste, because of its high uh, chemical oxygen demand, cannot be disposed in, uh, you know, in, in, in natural water or in natural land. It has to be treated somehow. And therefore, this way of recovering the biopolymers is a way to reduce the um, chemical oxygen demand and actually valorizing some of that um, so-called waste at the same time. And the quote I had in the previous slide, you know, was one from a, a colleague who works in environmental management who told me, you know, waste is not waste, it's just resource in the wrong place. And we really took this to, to heart to say, actually, these are not waste streams, they are resource streams that we can then valorize and utilize. So the thing, the aspect that I'm going to talk to you mostly today is, is the, the peel aspect where the peels can be shredded and dried initially because they are very wet, so they decompose very quickly. Um, and then we uh, applied micronization to make uh, powders of different particle sizes that can be then uh, extracted using green um, methods, uh, so mainly water-based methods, uh, dried, and we obtained various extracts which are then used. So we had food-grade powders and liquid ingredients uh, that were either used to produce cosmetics, and there was there is a, a line of cosmetics currently being commercialized in the United Kingdom. Uh, we also have various edible formats, including um, gels, emulsions, and films. The gels and emulsions were primarily used uh, as um, you know, ingredients for fat replacement. Um, and then we had a packaging stream where the um, ingredients were mainly incorporated as coatings on the surface of compostable packaging. And compostable packaging that comes in many different substrates, so you can get different, um, you know, properties of the of the of the um, material, as we've heard earlier. Um, but this can be functionalized then with different properties. So the packaging aspect was done by a company called P Parkside Flexibles, which is uh, quite near here in in, in uh, Wakefield near Leeds. Um, and they develop different uh, packaging solutions. Um, and they are um, very much at the forefront of developing compostable uh, packaging material. And there is a accreditation in the United Kingdom around how long should it take for a packaging to, to decompose or compost in, in a, a home. Um, so here you have an example of a snack that is packaged in compostable material and you can see that over six weeks it will then break up. You can see it breaking up here eventually to little pieces and starting to disappear into the, the, uh, the compost. Okay, and then you can see actually some of the asparagus actually still there um, after six weeks. So it seems to be fairly well uh, degraded over time. And we know that this approach can be helpful in reducing past plastic particles in soils, uh, which as we heard earlier, are, are a great environmental concern. And a, a study in Italy showed that, you know, composting pa packaging material can reduce particle 
uh, particles in soils from 20% occurrence to 1.5. So it can be quite effective. So as part of the CitruSafe project, uh, we uh, explored different um, packaging morphologies, if you like. We were looking primarily at things that have short shelf lives, including bread, which is the, one of the most wasted category of food in the United Kingdom. We also looked at some high risk uh, products, including fish and chicken. Uh, we looked at um, ripening of fruits, and we also started looking at ready, um, uh, ready meals. And ready meals are interesting, well, actually all of these are interesting because often they have more than one packaging component. And so you have to look at not just one, but several packaging components, often a see-through one uh, to allow the consumer to see the product. And then you have uh, something else that you can print on. Um, so in the case of uh, re ready-made meals, they often have a cardboard sleeve with all the information on it. And then you have a tray that is holding the product. But we do know that you know, packaging has a strong contribution to reducing food loss and waste. And in the UK, manufacturers are looking at you know, even one day shelf life extension could save uh, the UK 2.2 billion pounds per year. Uh, so it does make not just economic, not just environmental sense, but also economic sense. And I'm not going to talk too much about the technical aspects of these packaging, but I'm going to tell you um, some preliminary results about some of, of a survey that we did um, in both China and the UK. And the numbers of participants are quite small, but I think it started giving us some really interesting insights about what consumers think about um, environmentally friendly packaging. Um, and, you know, in particular, I'll, I'll highlight the, um, you know, the, the attitudes towards compostable packaging or the knowledge of that. So the questionnaire was structured uh, in looking at the mo motivations for purchasing. Will people buy it or not? Will they pay more for it? Uh, the recycling and composting behavior. So what, what do people do with the packaging once it's in their home? And also, uh, rating their env environmental consciences and knowledge. And I won't have time to take you through all of them, uh, all of the aspects today, but I will give you some highlights. So one of the things that we asked them first of all is, are you actually trying to reduce the amount of food packaging that you buy or use? Uh, and certainly that's something that we observe in the United Kingdom where, you know, there is a big ambition by consumers to reduce, eliminate food packaging um, not necessarily understanding the impacts that I might have on increasing food loss and waste and perhaps in increasing food safety risks. But we can see that 78% of UK consumers actually want to reduce the amount of packaging that they use. Um, but they say that it's difficult for them for limited op because they have limited options available. Um, so perhaps the best thing for them after trying to reduce food packaging is to look at environmentally friendly packaging. Um, in China, it's actually a more mixed picture. And in China, there's actually a lot less food packaging than there is in Europe um, and um, in the US. Um, very few foods are actually packaged uh, at the moment, but it's uh, really rising very, very quickly. Um, so the people that are trying to reduce food packaging are, you know, 45 to 75 year olds with bachelor degree or above, and certain, you know, generally higher environmental consciousness, but we didn't see an effect of gender or total income. But what were their motivations? We, we then asked them about, you know, would you buy environmentally friendly packaging? And, you know, we looked at, you know, if you buy it, what are your motivations for buying this packaging? And we can see here that the main motivation is to reduce environmental waste with the top answer in the UK and second answer in China. Um, in China, we, we saw that reducing human toxicity uh, was the top option. And I think there was a, a perception that, you know, packaging can actually, uh, you know, they, they are concerned about the, the, the toxicity of the packaging itself, uh, having some transfer of some um, packaging materials or chemicals from the packaging into the food. Well, that was a lot lower down in, in the United Kingdom. In terms of purchasing barriers, so why would why are you not buying environmentally friendly packaging? 
it came again it came back to there are very few options available for me to choose from and that was the top reason in both the uk and china and in china the second reason was again we're being worried about food safety so being worried that perhaps the environmentally friendly packaging doesn't have the same performance as other packaging well that was not a concern really much in the uk we also asked them if they would pay more for environmentally friendly packaging and the answer was mostly yes around 50 percent of people will pay around uh, 10 pence more or the equivalent in yuan and 25 percent of people would pay 50p more or the equivalent in yen yuan but we did observe that all the consumers are less willing to pay more so we looked at recycling behaviors and we compared the two countries and in the United Kingdom, most people always recycled or did it most of the time, but it was actually a lot less uh, common in China. And when we asked them about recycling bins and facilities for uh, collection at home uh, or from home rather, uh, then that was a, a big enabler of recycling in the United Kingdom while well, it was pretty limited in the in China. So a lot of people didn't have um, recycling bins at home and therefore did not recycle. And the motivations for recycling were to reduce the amounts of waste sent to landfills. And, you know, the other uh, options underneath were mainly environmentally driven. In China, it was actually to reduce water pollution. Um, well, in the UK, it was mainly land pollution. Uh, but for those people who recycled, it was they were less motivated by uh, the government mandating that in, in their area. And there's recycling barriers. Uh, the top one in the UK is that they're not always sure what materials are recyclable. And this is a real challenge for food packaging, where you have multiple components, some of which are recyclable, some of which are not. And people actually don't know. and sometimes just throw the whole thing into the into the bin um, and that was the second um, option in China there was also some uh, mention in China in particular about you know too much time and effort to wash the packaging and that is something that we do know that you know before you recycle you're meant to wash and, and get rid of some of the organic material to then to facilitate the recycling and you know it can be a barrier if it takes too much time and effort so we also explored very uh, briefly uh, some of the symbols that we can find on food packaging and we asked them whether they were familiar with these and most people were familiar with the recyclable uh, symbol uh, but not so much with the biodegradable or compostable symbols and when we did a survey of the different symbols that we could find on food packaging particularly for ready-made meals uh, we found that for some supermarkets, particularly the ones that have their own branding, um, it tends to be quite consistent and they tend to use this uh, um, circular symbol here. Uh, well, for some supermarkets that have more premium uh, uh, brands and they have many, many different brands, if you like, um, the, there was a great variety of different symbols and information. And so perhaps the consumer is probably less sure about what to do with that packaging where the information is different on different um, packaging, on different products. Um, and then when we asked the, 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 the participants which um, type of information or how would you like to receive the information, they did prefer the kind of quite simple but consistent messaging above written instructions or perhaps um, more you know, different and more different uh, information about the materials themselves. So that was quite insightful too. And I think for me, the, the most uh, surprising not, uh, but you know, the, the thing that I think we need to work more on is, is the, the, you know, what do people do with compostable food packaging when they have it at home? Um, so we do know that people want to buy more of these, but do they do what they're meant to do when they have it at home? And so when we asked them, well, how do you deal with your compostable packaging, uh, the majority of people in the UK and in China put it in the normal waste bin. And then the second segment here uh, in China is putting it in the recycling bin, which is also a significant 
proportion of UK consumers and only probably uh, about a third uh, either compost it at home or send it to a compostable facility. And that was very small proportion, only 5% in China. Um, so, you know, most consumers do not compost compostable food packaging at home. Is that through lack of composting facilities, but also we identified a lack of knowledge of what is compostable versus recyclable. And I think this has already been mentioned before, but if uh, compostable packaging ends up uh, in the normal bin, in a landfill, what happens to it? Uh, compostable packaging will behave like paper or cardboard and biodegrade in the top layers where there is oxygen. But essentially, it's a, it's a linear process, so it, it does end up as being waste. Um, it will take a long time to recover that resource into anything useful. In terms of recycling, um, again, it has been alluded to earlier in, in earlier talks that you know putting compostable packaging in the recycling can cause problems. Um, and this is particularly true for food packaging with multi-components, multi-layered um, parts uh, where people might not separate everything. It becomes quite a big effort to work out what is what, what goes where. Um, and the car, you know, the, some of it, the, the compostable one, you know, can probably be incorporated into the, the cardboard recycling, but it does come to cause some issues. Um, so it's it's not ideal really for perhaps uh, you know consumers wanting to buy this compostable packaging but not doing the right thing with it. So I think the take-home messages are that people are motivated to buy environmentally friendly packaging and that is recyclable or compostable and will pay a little bit more for it. Um, but they are confused about how to dispose of it, particularly for compostable packaging. Um, and, you know, there are limited home and communal composting facilities currently in the United Kingdom or in China, which is probably making, um, you know, it, it's really limiting the ability to, to, to compost. So that is uh, coming to the end of my talk. So just to really thank the CitruSafe Consortium, um, so these are over here the UK participants um, of the consortium, uh, but also we were uh, with uh, a number of well, with many uh, great Chinese collaborators as well. Um, our funders who provided, you know, with the opportunity to do this project, and I want to thank you uh, for your attention. And I will take some questions. Thank you. <laughs>